Oh, hi there. I was just sticking around on my phone expecting to magically get a life and feel amazing all of a sudden. I'm sure that at some point you've been told to get a life. People blame social media and the phone for their existence. We're screwed. Or are we? In this segment, I will give you 10 steps to create a thriving social life, even as an introvert. So before I give you 10 steps to create the social life of your dreams, I'd like to share and give a little bit of background about my own social life and why cultivating this was important to me. So for me, my journey started in 2019. I was trying to improve my dating life as a lot of young guys do. And so I started to go out a bit more and discover my interests. I went to dance classes and yoga classes, um, local music shows, um, even a few spiritual things here and there. Anything where I thought I could find other people who had similar interests and passions and that were like myself. But along the way, I met a lot of friends, created a few musical projects, and created a lot of experiences and memories. So why do we need to invest in our social lives? As popular as the Sigma male Ryan Gosling trope may be, we still need each other. We are social creatures as human beings whether it be from a personal development perspective, a romantic perspective, or even an ambitious or entrepreneurial perspective. We still need other people to accomplish our goals and other people need us to accomplish theirs as well. So for step number one, I would like to begin with expectations. Expectations are critical because before we even head out the door, turn on the ignition and put our foot to the gas, this determines how our night is going to begin. So. If we put immense pressure on ourselves and expect to have the time of our lives, um, and you know, you go out, you, you will have a few nights like that. Um, but expecting to have this all of the time can set us up for failure because then we may feel like we're obligated to, if it's not the time of our lives, then it, it's not worth pursuing and investing. Um, for instance, with college, I expected when I was younger, because of what I was told, that it would just be you know, partying all the time and all this. But when I eventually went to college, it wasn't like that all the time. And I actually kind of lost interest in just relentless partying and you know, kind of hedonism for, um, for the sake of it. Um, so even though that was something I, I an expectation I had of what a good time would be, based on what other people were saying, um, I found that I had to invest in my social life on my terms and you know, cultivate my own healthy expectations. As far as mindset goes, it's, it's good to have you know, an, the right expectations. You know, most of the time you're gonna be going out um, and people are just chilling. Having accurate uh, expectations for your night out is, is great for having a thriving social life. Step number two is limiting beliefs. Speaking personally, I've I've had a mindset of, you know, especially the past few years, things are there's been you know some, you could say societal difficulties. You may have limiting beliefs like, oh, you know, our parents' generation had these social lives and all these memories, and with social media, everybody's on their phones, and it's just not possible for me to have the kind of connection that was once possible in the past. And I think there is some truth. Um, to that, you know, everybody's attention spans are, are fried and so forth. Um, and there's some data um, that suggests that's the case. You know, I know I felt that way for a long time, but you know, is this really true? If you actually do take the time to go out, you know, see for yourself and see if that's really the case. You know, I bet you there's, you know, in reality there are so many things that you could do with your time um, and your energy. Um, there's more fun things to do in any night of the week, um, you know, in your state and maybe in, in, in your city than um, you know what to do with if you know um, where to look for and if you make the right investment. Which leads us to step number three, which is investing in your social life. So if we are very pragmatic and realistic about how we spend our time and our resources, you know, are we spending, and there's, there's not inherently anything wrong with gaming, but if we're spending you know, three to five hours every night, gaming every night, 
well, you know, a couple nights, you know, maybe one or two nights a week, we could spend going out and meeting people. You know, maybe there's a particular interest you have, like D&D, or, um, or there's some kind of art class or painting class you could take. You know, really take the interests that you have and try to find the communities of, of people that also share those interests. So go out, you know, ask a friend, you know, ask people to find those, to help find, uh, to help you find those communities, but also invest the time and resources um, as necessary. So being really realistic and honest about how we spend our time in a way that creates uh, a thriving social life. If you're interested, I have a video called How to Focus, and in the second half of it, I actually go over how to create a bit more optimized schedule. So. If you are interested in investing in your social life, but also scheduling, creating a schedule in a conscious way, so that way you can allocate the time and resources um, to your social life, then I will put a link to that in the description. Step number four is work out before you go out. I'm sure that a lot of us in this day and age, you know, struggle with social anxiety. That's a pretty common thing. I know I used to struggle with it more, and I'm not a doctor, I'm not a clinical psychologist, so. Um, speak to an expert at, if needed, if it is um, that much of a problem. Um, however, just, just as a practical thing to reduce anxiety in terms of to share what's worked for me, I find that if I work out before I go out, um, it burns some of the excess energy. And when I am showing up to places, I can be in a more um, calm sort of natural state instead of being anxious and, and agitated. So work out before you go out is a good way to um, for your physical fitness but also your mental and social fitness as well and in the future I actually do plan on making a video about the the philosophy of fitness as well to go into more detail about that subject step number five is the early bird gets the worm I actually had to learn this the hard way last night because I was 15 minutes late for an open mic and it was actually um, completely signed up so I, I didn't get to play so being early, of course, is, is great from a logistics standpoint because it's easier to park. It's easier to just, it just makes the experience I find less stressful and you tend to get access to more things. Um, you know, sometimes you might want to show up later, you know, depending once you're a regular and kind of get a feel for things. Um, you could show up in the middle. You know, I know the New York scene is kind of a bit more like that um, when there's a bit more action. But an advantage to being early from a social point of view is that when we, we, if we're kind of new to socializing and developing our social skills, um, it can be intimidating to approach people when they're in the middle of a conversation or when there's just this it's kind of this huge monstrosity of just people and activity that can be kind of overwhelming for us at first. When you're early, there's not much activity. So it can actually be a, a great time to approach people because they're bored and have nothing, else, nothing better to do than interact with you. Whereas by contrast, if it's the end of something, people might be in a rush to get an appointment or to work or some kind of other, they just want to get home, some other kind of obligation, unless there's an after party, that would be the exception. But um, towards the end, people want to go on to the next thing. Um, so being early, it's, you get more access to things. Um, people are generally more um, approachable. Step number six is reading the room. So as I've gone out to a number of places, I've noticed that some physical spaces within a place are more optimized for socializing than others. So, you know, someone for me that, um, you know, someone like me that's more introverted I don't find approaching conversations immediately on the dance floor to be um, intuitive. You know, it's kind of loud. Case in point, um, it's kind of loud and hard to hear what people are saying. So I kind of think the dance floor is more for dancing, whereas there might be a space where people are having drinks, maybe by the bar or outside where people are having drinks, having a smoke, um, and that could be more optimized, that could be more optimal for, for socializing. 
So when you're going out, just being aware of the spaces where people are clustered and having conversations to find those opportunities in a more optimal way. Now that we've addressed reading rooms, we can move on to reading bodies. Uh, poses, poses, not parts. Let's, let's be a little bit appropriate here. So step number seven is reading minds with bodies, the use of body language. So in our, as Robert Greene has brilliantly pointed out in his Laws of Human Nature, in, in our age of social media, because we're looking at text and screens all the time, this forces us to look at language purely at the surface level and looking at words when people are speaking and not also seeing what their, their physical body is saying. Um, you know, there's a lot of woo-woo and a lot, a lot of, you know, bullshit around, around body language, right? Um, but generally the way that I see body language is, you know, one of two categories. Either they're kind of leaning into you, there's an open body language, there's an openness to it, where they're receptive, you can, you can see that somebody is taking joy in engaging with you, or they're kind of like, you know, facing away. Or, or, or shriveling um, and that kind of thing. So, um, you know, that's body language that indicates that somebody doesn't want anything to fucking do with you. So in, in those two categories, that's a good way to read um, how others are, are perceiving us because um, it can be frustrating because, you know, let's say, you know, somebody could say one thing, they might, you know, seem like they're just being friendly or nice, but their, their body language and their actions are, are completely different. Um, I know a lot of guys, you know, particularly with dating, kind of complain about mixed signals, right, and that kind of thing. And so being aware of body language and, and people's actions and how they hold themselves can be very instructive. Um, even just in the face, you know, as we're looking at somebody in the eyes and seeing the expressions on their face, we can see their reactions in real time and how we're being received. So body language is an incredibly useful tool and, and skill set for cultivating our social life. Step number eight is to have what's called a what's it in 92 tricks to talk to people. So you might have a shirt or a ring or a necklace or some kind of item that has a story to it or even a tattoo. And it might just, it might have an interesting story to it that you'd like to share or it's, it's something colorful that's a use um, to start a conversation. Um, starting conversations can be um, difficult, but having some kind of thing of interest can be a good way for people to approach you and, and share your story with them. And inversely, if other people have something, um, there's a shirt of a band or they're reading a book or there's just something about them that you think is interesting, that can be a good way to approach them. So having a what's it can be a good way for people to approach you and talk about interests you have in common. Or if you notice other people's what's it, it can be a good way for you to start a conversation with them. Step number nine is how to be interesting. So an insecurity that sometimes I hear is that, you know, I'm boring or I don't have anything to say that's interesting. And I think that's the opposite of the case. I think everybody at some point has to have some kind of story or experience or insight perspective that can be useful for other people if they share. So having stories and experiences that, that we've had that are interesting and, and, and sharing those um, can be a great way to connect with people. But there's also something to being observant and, and listening um, to other, and having interests in other people's stories. So being interesting is also being interested in, in others. As much as we may like to share our stories or our goals or our objectives and what we're interested in, it's also good to have that same level of interest or even more with others. So um, if somebody's sharing something um, and you're curious to be asking questions. So something to be mindful of is you know, how much are, are we sharing and expressing? And this doesn't have to be a down the line 50-50 sort of ratio, but it is something generally to keep in mind because, you know, we or someone else, you know, might have a story that people are really leaning into and have interest. So it's good to share that in that perspective. But especially as Robert Greene has pointed out, um, listening 
and and holding space for other other people and and having interest in them is a very seductive trait and a great way to build connection and your social life. Step number 10, our final step is knowing when to leave. So whether for any reason, you know, maybe it's just you're not having a great time or you're just, you know, kind of stressed out. Um, sometimes it can be better to just head out and, and take off. You went out, you had a few couple drinks, it's been maybe two hours and you know maybe if it's not you're just not feeling it for another hour then maybe it's just better to you know take off and call a night you know save work or something i know i've had a couple occasions where i just wasn't feeling it and so you know i just waited maybe another hour and just call it a night um, but there were also other occasions where i decided to stick it out and you know try to meet some people and put myself out there and even just meeting one person, I mean, usually that's my goal is, you know, just try to you know, have one decent conversation with a person before I leave. Um, and it turned around for the better. Um, so, you know, that can, you know, be by your call is, you know, deciding when you're just not feeling it and you want to take off um, for the, and call it a night or to stick in there and, you know, maybe try and put yourself out there a bit and, and test yourself. Um, especially if there's if there's any kind of drama or any kind of BS um, you know you can always just leave um, and you know it's not something you necessarily want to participate in so there you have 10 steps to create a thriving social life I'm Parker Thibault of Focus Shift Media peace and be well be sure you to hit like and subscribe for me and become a patron on patreon if you'd like to support the work that we do peace and stay groovy